Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to this very early morning. Get your coffee, tea, and water, and let's get started. Uh, thank you for attending the part two of to the 2021 Leadership Series kickoff, Big Opportunities and the Pathway to Reimagine, our second of part five series focusing today on supply chain. As you know, we are now the Society for Sustainable Events, SFSC, and our mission remains the same, to advocate and educate around sustainability in the meetings and event industry. And our great educational programming like today will continue. For today's event and our series, um, we have many thought leaders and organizers that have come together in this time of environmental crisis to unite our industry with a plan to offer change. We can make a difference and I can't wait. So just on a housekeeping note, uh, please mute uh, yourself. And uh, now I would like to really thank our sponsors because without them, uh, we wouldn't be here today. So I really want to thank Medavant for their extraordinary work. Uh, Solus Sustainable Adoration, amazing. And Orange Photography, of course. But first, um, I would like to introduce uh, today's session host, Dr. Aurora Dawn Benton. Aurora is the founder and chief change agent of Astrapto, uh, which offers courses, coaching, and consulting to advance um, sustainability in the hospitality, event, and travel, and other services. The passion is to make sustainability practical and positive for people whose job is not sustainability but who have a passion to drive positive impact and through their organizations. So Aurora, welcome and it's Thank all you. yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's great to see everyone here today. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're calling in from and thank you for joining us. First thing I'm gonna do is introduce a speaker who I'm delighted to have share with us some best practices and case studies. That's gonna be a brief presentation and then I'm gonna do a brief setup for our panel discussion where we're really going to illuminate and dive deeper into the topic of supplier diversity and buying local. So I'd like to introduce you to Gwen Megida. I'm sure many of you on the call are already familiar with her and her amazing work. She is the Vice President of Social Impact, Sustainability, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Caesars Entertainment. Working with more than 50,000 team members at 50 domestic and international resorts, Gwen sets the strategy and drives the management plan for Caesars Entertainment's corporate social responsibility initiatives, including sustainability, diversity, equity, and inclusion, responsible gaming, and community impact. Gwen leads the industry in assessing macro trends and issues that may affect the business and development goals. She is on the forefront of utilizing intersectional strategies to show that strong CSR programs deliver purpose and a positive financial outcome. Her work involves human rights, social impact, ESG, investor research issues, and outcomes based on corporate and environmental responsibility strategy. Gwen is currently the DEI Committee Chair for Sustainable Brands Advisory Board. She's on Disability Inn's Chief Diversity Officer Forum and the CSR Coalition Co-Chair with Nevada Resorts Association. She and her wife, Ku, enjoy parenting their budding social advocates, Max7 and Ava5, in their pseudo spare time. Gwen, welcome, and we're looking forward to what you're going to share with us today, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Aurora. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for having me today. I really appreciate this. Uh, speaking of pseudo spare time, I'm on my headset because we're trying to keep the little ones uh, asleep as we're with uh, Hawaii uh, family members. Uh, so I'm in a I don't have a cold. I'm in a very uh, 40 year old household with a lot of dust. So excuse my uh, my coughing every now and then. First of first off, I'd like to share some perspective on kind of the the macro landscape of mostly in a, an American state based approach to um, uh, to meetings and particularly around DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, and sustainability when merging um, both areas together as, as we have done over the past uh, seven years. So or if you could switch to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the next slide. Now, if I think about um, the, the areas of economic and supplier diversity, um, the economic impact, we have a, a, a huge era in space where 
there's a lot of philanthropy, there's a lot of reinvestment, there's a lot of studies going off, there's a lot of relief funding, but the pieces that have you know, continued to, to need to, to be pulled together are around actionable, intentional inclusion, metrics, outcomes, approach, and transparency around corporate supply chains. And this being around, particularly around the minority suppliers in the supply chain. Um, it's a sustainable business engagement going beyond a meeting or a, a design forum, a convention center. I'm going to be, you know, pretty pretty forthright and and transparent about my comments today. I mean, may or may not reflect the comments on behalf of my my industry or company because I think it's really important to have these honest dialogues about where the gaps and opportunities are, um, particularly in a space that has so much interest and so much support, such as with organizations like yourselves. You know, we we do realize that there are a lot of unconscious biases when it comes to um, decision making from a local supply chain whether it be the supplier who bakes a cake or for, for a convention or a meeting, or the supplier who, who looks at um, a tier, what we call tier one, two, or three. There's subs, there's subs, there's subs of contractors. There's lack of transparency, even amongst those who are making those purchasing decisions. So it's a very dispersed uh, purchasing practice. There's also a lack of access to capital. And these are the things that suppliers often don't share, even amongst your own supply chain or our own supply chain, because there's not that in, in most cases, there's not that level of comfort around the lack of access to capital because that in some cases will show a, a, a sign of lack of inability to deliver a service or product or lack of inability to scale um, to, to meet a, a larger or even a larger customer or, or event coming to, to that community. The systemic racism, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time over the past uh, seven years as I Sold the DEI um, under my, my portfolio at Caesars. There, there are about um, nine majors, what I call major partners out there from the U.S. Black Chamber, U.S. Hispanic Chamber, U.S. PAC, the Women's, um, Women's Economic um, National, uh, We Bank. Um, there's also Native American organization as well. And all of them are, are very polite about how they share, engage with corporate partners. It's, it's generally around the year four, five, or six you get into the more honest dialogues about what they're facing and what they're seeing when it comes to engaging um, corporate types, because many of them happen to be their supporters and sponsors as well, but they're, they're very um, uh, dignified when they share the challenges um, um, of working with, with buyers. Of course, there's perceived public images. I mean, I, I can tell you how many times a day or a week I hear, around, hear the comments around, they're too small, I can't find them, they don't provide quality services or products, they're not they're too expensive. Um, they provide quote unquote pass through services just to get that, you know, again, this is myth. <laughs> um, the comments and pushback, quote unquote, this organization might pass through the service. They're not a real quote unquote minority supplier um, because they uh, may be located in this location or they might be 51% of the other, but not actively operating as such. Of course, there's all of these certifying bodies from the organizations that I mentioned, but, you know, there there is. Um, a lot of checks and balances when it comes to on-site reviews or certified um, suppliers as well. So I really think, and I would really advocate that we um, collectively, you know, the supporters of supplier diversity, really work on demystifying the supply chain. And there, there are a lot of innovat innovative solutions out there. There's, there's cost-cutting best practices as well. For example, about 10 years ago, when we went deeper, Caesars, then Harris Entertainment, went deeper into a supply chain strategy looked at growing the pool of diversity, diverse suppliers. Um, the assumptions, of course, were what you heard earlier, but when it came down to it, it was a net net um, cost neutral approach to go very deep into identifying, sourcing, growing the pool of diverse suppliers. So it was not more expensive. In fact, it was less expensive to be actively identifying targets and goals in this space. And of course, there are these. Um, suppliers themselves are, are really <clears throat> differentiating with competitive advantages. I find them very creative, very innovative, come to the table that goes, it's a plus-plus relationship, goes beyond the service and, and, uh, and product they tend to sell, but it's, it's a very much of a networked approach, um, holistic relationship when it comes to uh, working with, uh, with corporate or, or purchasers. So I, 
I um, advocate, and I think we're all on the same page when I say, you know, really looking at how, do, how can we come together as a coalition or an intersectional um, industry or, or practices between sustainability and supplier uh, diversity to, to come to solutions. Or if we could shift to the next page, please. I really want to emphasize here <clears throat> um, the Black-owned businesses, because I think, and this even happens in the supplier diversity space, when someone says, I'm an advocate of supplier diversity, in most cases, they're talking about a white woman-owned business, um, but not necessarily on these businesses who tend to be Black-owned that have a significant uphill battle to to achieve, even amongst those, those supporters. Because I think the, the numbers here kind of just show show you um, the, the, the tiny percent of, of, um, of where the capital is, of, of the Black-owned businesses who are employers, of, um, of the companies who are public, uh, which are Black-owned businesses. Uh, Ron Bugsby of the U.S. Black Chamber um, and has long been a partner of ours, huge in terms of the policy side, very much around looking at changes and removing the obstacles in the contracts themselves um, to, to leverage scale in, in terms of buying black owned, from Black-owned companies. And MSDC, National Minority Supply Diversity Council, Development Council, there on the bottom, um, is, is one of the largest national certifiers. Um, but note that the challenges are, in some states, um, NMSDC certification might be <laughs> acceptable, but in other states it might be a disability in, like Indiana, veteran-owned businesses from Nevaboa. They all have very complex acronyms, um, but there isn't any consistency between states. We operate in virtually every state, and comparing our our work in the Indiana versus Illinois or Iowa, or New Jersey, it's a it's a very it's, it's probably worse than a patchwork, uh, given the state-based regulators who, who really advocate or manage the space around um, working through uh, supplier diversity goals with their operating uh, employees, employers. So the goals here in terms of Black-owned businesses are you know, clearly around equity and the supply base, being transparent uh, to influence the workforce and representation, uh, really looking at um, the community outreach and suppliers I can tell you that as late as last week, when we have large customers or corporate clients who might have a citywide event in, say, Las Vegas or Atlantic City or Lake Tahoe, where we operate, um, when when the customer says, you know, again, no fault to them, I want to make a huge impact. I want to do something that is sustainable. I want to do something innovative here. They're talking about doing less bad, right? Carbon reduction, greenhouse gas reduction still today, but not looking at the most complex, um, I guess, immediate need around social sustainability. I mean, this is a huge opportunity. So there's a large, and there continues to be a large disconnect amongst, um, you know, the planners that we, we tend to see. Um, we introduced, CETA's introduced green meetings internally ourselves about 13 years ago, and it really shifted to responsible meeting certification. Even we have to have, I, I would say, another day-long investment in terms of the equity and inclusion aspects to really get into um, the complexities and opportunities with supplier diversity, as well as other avenues of diversity. So I really want to emphasize the goals to pause here, as, as you see on the slide. Um, moving on to the next and last slide, I just put for thought, I um, really want to highlight the steps around the supplier diversity and equity. I mean, for example, it's I mean, very clearly around empathize, understand, create, and deliver. When I think about our journey over the past a decade at seizures in looking at um, very heavily around sustainability and as we're de developing the supplier diversity space, we intentionally built director and VP positions that had both roles so that they would intentionally look at the intersection, driving both, let's just say, relationship with CDP as well as a relationship with the Minority Supplier Council for that region. And that was very intentional because we, we see a lot of opportunity for um, defining and ideating with minority suppliers, um, looking at ways to deepen the relationship through, say, the Seizures Foundation. Um, you know, how do we get deeper in terms of capacity building? Not necessarily just going straight into sourcing, ready, willing, and able suppliers, but an economic equity tour with WeBank that we've uh, reintroduced uh, this year on um, spending more time in a year round rapport, bringing in other. Um, suppliers and vendors and partners like Microsoft and Bank of America to also bring the tools and support um, around how they to define supplier diversity. So these are 
you know, tools and from uh, Microsoft packages to um, stipends that we've given in terms of the level of engagement and resources these um, uh, minority suppliers have used through the, the Seizures Foundation tour. And then ideating how do we take this from year to year in terms of growing a deeper rapport on the gaps and opportunities. And again, access to capital, the ability to market and to communicate and to hire employ. There's a host of things that we continue to focus on with outside experts. Um, this is just one example of an opportunity. But I think the biggest opportunity when you think about delivering is really around the execution and measurement aspects. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, apples to oranges, kumquats, all sorts of fruits. When I mean, you look at a, even a state-based approach, so just in, in, if companies publish their numbers, which we do to state-based regulators, there is no, com no ability to compare how well you're doing in one state or another. Um, I think that is you know, one, I mean, it's a big lift uh, to work with state regulators to, you know, as outside bodies or advocates. But I think if there's ways to standardize, you know, how do you look at growing the pool of suppliers versus looking at the percent of your supply chain as well? Um, and then lastly, you think about uh, coalition building um, organizations like yours, our, our corporate suppliers, our corporate partners, as well as our uh, minority supplier advocates is a huge opportunity to, to standardize this ideation and execution. So I'll leave you with this food for thought about how we can move forward, um, collaborate and work together uh, year round on, on learning and advocating for such an important space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gwen. That was a really fantastic setup for where we want to go today. I love the fact that you ended us with a framework because this whole leadership series is really about not just education, but about designing solutions. And that might look like a roadmap, a toolkit, a checklist, something practical that people can use in sort of a day-to-day -day, uh, decision-making context in order to be able to move the needle on the things that we're talking about today. When I was asked to lead the, you know, this leadership series has three parts. There's carbon, consumption, and supply chain. And when I was asked to lead the supply chain conversation, I was, of course, ecstatic and, and honored by that request. And because, you know, when you're asked to lead something, you get to control it a little bit. And so one of the first things I said is, well, we need to scope this. If we're really talking about developing practical solutions, we need to have a more refined scope so that we can really produce something. Even if it just solves one problem, at least we're going to solve a problem. And uh, so I geared, I steered us into the direction of supplier diversity and buying local and buying small. These are topics that are really near and dear to my heart. Uh, first, I just wanna say that, um, you know, a couple of things. One is if you're thinking about other parts of the supply chain, we hope to get to those. Maybe we'll do other series in 2022 and beyond, but, but for today, we really wanna try to scope this around buying local, small and diverse. Um, the point you know, Gwen made about this assumption that diverse means small business, uh, it doesn't always mean that. But statistically speaking, which I think was also reflected in some of the slides she shared on Black businesses, in the United States, 89.1% of all businesses are 20 employees or less. 98 point, sorry, I'm forgetting 99.1, I think, percent of all businesses are 500 people or less and technically qualify as a small business by the, the small, small Business Associate, um, Association or agency, sorry, of the government. So it's not necessarily that diverse means small, but in what I'm gonna present now, really thinking about the challenges that small businesses face, diverse businesses face those same challenges, but really kind of magnified based on some of the things that, that of course you heard Gwen say, I wanna expound on some of those those ideas. Um, and as I said, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I've spent more than a decade mentoring social entrepreneurs. I helped co-found a social enterprise incubator back in 2012 when it was not a popular thing that it is today. It's become uh, quite a different uh, phenomenon, which is really great to see. And my doctoral study was actually on small food producers who have a social or environmental mission and looking at the, the obstacles they face. So this framework that I'm gonna share with you really is born out of that experience. And I'm hoping that together we can leverage that, that research and that, that work and really try to create something practical we can use to solve some of the problems. I'll also be introducing you to a couple of additional panelists who I think are going to really be able to illuminate 
the, the supplier side, but also really have empathy for and understand the buyer side as well. So these four C's the, that, I've, that I came up with in my research are the barriers that I see most often. And initially I was studying the supplier side of these barriers, but as I began to work more in hospitality and events over the last decade, I was like, well, duh, <laughs> these things are sort of two sides of the same coin, right? And the institutional and anchor, anchor institutions like hospitals, universities, hotels, convention centers, et cetera, have an opportunity to use their leverage and their power to help solve some of the problems from the supplier side. Um, so of course you would think, oh, this is great. This equation works. But as we know, obviously it's not as easy as all that. So we're gonna talk about some of the the nuances of these issues. And then I wanna break it down from the perspective of the, the buyer side, the supplier side, and talk at the end with our panelists about some possibilities. So first, the struggle is real. It is real. From the buyer perspective, as much as you might want to do the right thing and really prioritize supplier diversity and buying local, the, the struggle is, is real. So let's start with cost. You know, I think we've gotten really good at making the business case for replacing light bulbs and reducing waste, but the social impact uh, business case is much more challenging to create. It's more longitudinal. It is more an external return than it is an internal return. Although as Gwen highlighted, there are certainly internal returns in terms of innovation and creativity and such, but it's a little harder to put numbers on those. And, and I think Gwen also talked about some of those differences, even with reporting and different agencies and all of that data is what you need to be able to make a good business case. And that's not necessarily in the skill set that maybe most of you in the audience have at your fingertips to be able to justify that internal uh, ex extra cost. And those costs are, are real. And we'll talk about that from the supplier side in a moment. Contracts. This is the one that I hear the most is contracts. They are designed to be uh, to lock in buyer and supplier relationships that guarantee price, quality, et cetera. And it is very difficult to get out of them. You know, I think about one particular example I'm aware of where somebody who works at a business unit of a global corporation that has made global commitments to supplier diversity, this person spent a year trying to work with corporate to get a local minority food producer into the contract or to be able to get a contract, a year. And so just imagine if there's turnover in positions and all of the things that can get away, get in the way. And th with the failure rate of small businesses, will that person even be around in a year? So this is the very real problem that, that we face from the buyer side. Capacity, if you're running large events, if you're running events in the thousands, you know, especially on the food side, trying to scale your business as a small producer to be able to accommodate such a large event and be able to still satisfy your other customers, that's really challenging. So as a buyer, it can be risky to think, oh, I'm gonna work with somebody who may not be able to deliver on what I've, what I've ordered. And then even think about something like this. Imagine you have a situation where you're gonna work with a transportation provider who is a minority veteran owned business, but his fleet is too small to accommodate the size of event you have. Are you going to have multiple transportation contracts? Or are you gonna go with the white owned larger national brand? Who by the way, is also adding electric vehicles to their fleet. So maybe you're being driven more to the environmental decision. And so the, the minority veteran owned business gets left off, the, you know, off of this deal because of sort of multiple things working against them. But as from the buyer perspective, this is a very real concern, something you really have to think about. How many different contracts do you wanna enter? How many different vendors do you wanna deal with? What are your priorities at the end of the day? And then chaos. Um, small businesses can be sometimes difficult to deal with and unprofessional, but it just is what it is. It's the nature of uh, being an entrepreneur and being a small business. That doesn't mean that you can't work around that. And I think that some of the things that Gwen offered earlier are, are very encouraging and inspirational to say, hey, kind of get over it. <laughs> like we got to solve this problem and, and work to get past this issue. Now, from the supplier standpoint, I titled this, the system is broken because 
like I said earlier, it's hard enough if you're a small business, but if you are a minority small business or a disadvantaged small business in any way, the system is literally designed to make it even dif more difficult for you in terms of banking, in terms of su uh, business support systems, et cetera. So cost, um, it's really tough for small businesses to afford to scale, to afford economies of scale, to compete with larger businesses, in mar especially in marketing and sales. Uh, they don't have millions to throw into advertising. Uh, sometimes they can't even afford maybe the CDB membership to be listed uh, in the, you know, uh, with other, with their competitors. So cost is a very real thing, but also more importantly than anything is cost of capital. It's very difficult for minorities to be able to access the same lines of credit at the same rates as their white competitors. And so we have to really start kind of unpacking these, these barriers and these obstacles and ask, well, what can we do to ensure that cost of capital isn't the reason that this small business isn't getting ahead? Um, I recently read about, I think in Portland, or maybe it's the state of Oregon, they passed a new law that's going to help uh, set up a fund to compensate banks for uh, minority business owners who default on loans or to help them also set up a fund to be able to get more access to funds. So we need more of that. And that's one thing you might be able to advocate for. Um, Contracts, very difficult to compete with for the contracts, but I'll tell you the biggest thing here that you may not even think about is terms. Cash flow is a major, major issue for small businesses. And when your contracts require 60 and 90 day payment terms, that can be crippling for a small business. And that's sort of standard operating procedure. I remember the first time I got one of those, I was like, 60 days? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I can't. I can't accept 60 day terms, <laughs> like at the end of the project, right? So these are very, very common things that, that you'll th that you'll see from the you know small business side. But if, you're, if your mindset is corporate, you, you may not even think about those things, right? Because you have lines of credit and you have cash that's always gonna sort of always be there, right? So you have to be thinking about that from the small business perspective. Capacity is very hard. It's a difficult thing to scale from here to here. There's a lot of risk that comes into play, and it also might mean reformulating different packaging, different uh, manufacturing processes, all of these things that add complexity and risk to the small uh, vendor. So as a buyer, you have to think about what they're facing to be able to scale to reach your capacity. And then finally, chaos. You know, most people don't get into business because they love bookkeeping. <laughs> They get into business because they love their grandma's cookie recipe and now it's, you know, this famous cookie or they want, they have a better way to make juice or, you know, maybe they love tinkering with cars and decide to start a transportation service or, you know, they're a creative and start an advertising agency. So a lot of times those, that maturity and sophistication of running a business kind of gets lost on them and they need a lot of support and, and help when it comes to business mentoring and just maturing and becoming more sophisticated in their business. Now, that's a quick uh, rundown of all of that. Now I wanna really bring those things to life. I wanna bring in our other panelists. And first I wanna ask a series of questions from the perspective of the buyer. So again, the struggle is real. And then I'm gonna ask a series of questions for us to think about the supplier side. And then I'm gonna ask the panelists to talk about what they see as the possibilities. What can we really achieve and what are the benefits if we can work past these issues? So let me quickly introduce the other two panelists. Gwen, thank you for sticking around and joining us. I look forward to your contributions to this. And I'd like to also introduce Kim Bryden. Kim was one of the first people that I met when I moved to Baltimore and she was just such a friendly, lovely person and just really op helped open some doors for me in, in this research that I was doing at the time on food entrepreneurs. So I always have a special place in my heart for what Kim is doing and, and what she brings to the world. She's the CEO of Create. She's an accomplished strategic business development professional with expertise in marketing, merchandising, and operations focusing on the food and beverage industry. Lisbon consulted over three businesses on growth strategies, building out diversity and identifying new market opportunities. In addition to her commitment to small business growth at large, Kim's expertise has led her to develop multi-sector public-private partnerships across industries such as governmental agencies, food tech startups, 
and top five, Fortune 500 retailers and food service operators. I'd also like to introduce you to someone I just recently met through this um, getting this panel together. Jeanette is from Detroit, a city that I have grown to really love over recent years. And I'm super excited as I've learned more about what Jeanette is doing. Jeanette Pierce is a social entrepreneur who is both a data nerd and engaging storyteller. She loves cities and works with them to help locals discover the amazing people, places and projects that make their town unique. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and I don't know if we wanna maybe, um, I should stop share so that we're sort of on um, screen here, um, highlight. I think uh, our wonderful tech gurus in the background have highlighted this. So thank you so much um, for joining the panel. I wanna start with the buyer side of the equation and think about those barriers, cost, contracts, capacity, and chaos, and hear your examples and tips and data, uh, Jeanette. <laughs> so Kim, let's start with you. Um, putting yourself in the buyer's shoes, how are costs and contracts that are encountered in the process, how does this become a barrier for the buyer when working with the small, local, and diverse supplier? And what can buyers do to overcome the cost and contract issue? Yeah, great question. So just to give a little context behind my answer. Uh, so at Curate, we embed as the local purchasing team at anchor institution accounts like hospitals, universities, sports arenas, convention centers, and the like. And a lot of the reason why is because I'm sure as professionals yourselves in the buying capacity, it is very hard for you to go one by one by one to every individual supplier. It's hard for you dealing with a lot of logistics on your plate, and it's also hard for your accounts payable, right? It's all, all types of struggles when it comes to the contracting process through to payment. And so what we act as, again, as that local purchasing team is that we become that entity that's finding, vetting and sourcing local suppliers to meet your demand needs. Um, and in that process, something that we were really work very closely with with our buyer partners is figuring out new language around RFPs. And so something that I wanted to bring up very quickly here is that when we're thinking about putting out an ask to our local diverse small business community is starting with what is the problem we're actually trying to solve as opposed to coming up with our own solution and then bidding out just for the solution. As an example, you have a breakfast that you need to serve for 200 people you put out an RFP that's like, I need a continental breakfast with frozen mini bagels and individual package of yogurt and orange juice and coffee, right? You're very prescriptive. You already, you already came up with a predetermined solution as to what you think breakfast should be. Instead, think, I've got a breakfast for 200 people. How might we design this to better reflect the local community? and then solicit bids back. And the best thing you can do is be very clear with managing your own expectations and, and the potential small business. For example, in, in that, how might we have a breakfast for 200 people that best reflects our local community? My budget maximum is $12 a person. I, I can't exceed that. And so I've now given you a parameter in which now you can come back with a creative proposal and solution to come up with what that might look like, as opposed to you already prescribing to me what you think a breakfast should look like. And so that's really something we, we are very adamant with on our um, buyer partner conversations and, and really allowing small businesses to step up to the table and, and demonstrate their creativity, because you will not get that creativity from your broadline distributors. You just won't. I love it. I love, 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 love that example. That's awesome, Kim. Thank you for that. So Jeanette, I'd like to ask you about the capacity question, but of course also invite all of you to chime in on any of these. I'm sure that you might have heard something like, well, you know, I have an event for 5,000 people and this, this entrepreneur really can't handle the capacity, whatever that might be. It might be a space limitation, an ingredient limitation, whatever it is. How do you respond to that? And, and maybe share examples of, of when you've encountered this. Yeah, and thanks so much for having me today. And this is such a great, important conversation. Um, you know, there's first, the first order of business is actually knowing what 
minority or now we're using global majority um, uh, suppliers are out there and in the community, right? And I feel like that's where like, more often we don't even people don't even know that they exist and assume that they they just don't exist and don't have the capacity um but capacity issues a lot of times collaboration is the answer right so uh our small businesses in detroit especially that we work so closely with it's i've heard it be very different in other places but ours work together all the time multiple two bakeries will have a you know work together or there we have a whole thing called detroit kitchen connect where a bunch of food producers all use different kitchens but share the space and 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 i feel like the answer to capacity is frequently collaboration because maybe one supplier is not going to be able to do 5,000 cupcakes, um, but, you know, two or three might be able to do that. And especially when they're used to working together, and I know it can be, again, it's scary. I get it from the supplier. Oh, that's multiple people. Um, but there are lots of examples of them working together to, to fulfill that need. Um, and it's going to be worth it, right? So, I mean, I think the biggest takeaway that I, you know, the first thing I just want to say as we talk about all of this is all of these challenges uh, do exist in, in many ways. And uh, anything worth doing, right, is worth doing well. And if you, when you have that breakfast that Kim was talking about, people are going to be like, this is so amazing. Like, oh, I'm so glad it's not just another frozen bagel, right? Or wow, this cookie, this cupcake, uh, you can taste the passion in people's food uh, or whatever they're doing because it is a passion and that's what drives people to create small businesses in the first place uh, and I think then you add the story I think it's also really important to say okay well here's capacity and maybe we do have to use two or three vendors to get to that capacity but then you can share the story of those vendors right and that makes it tastes better too. Just like if you go to a museum, you can look at a painting and say, well, that's a beautiful painting. But when you hear the story, what, what the artist was going through and, you know, and what it meant and what he was referring to, you, you just feel more connected to that painting. And the same happens with any type of food or, you know, vendor that you might uh, be looking for for your business. So, uh, and sometimes it isn't isn't going to be a good fit. You know, that's also it. Maybe you can't get five thousand. Maybe then you decide that you can do a uh, hundred for like all your speakers and board members right? Find a smaller group within your group that can fit the capacity of, uh, of, an, of a small business. Uh, and then again, if it doesn't work, at least you've actually made that connection, made that, made that um, uh, attempt, and maybe that business can learn and say, okay, I never even thought about doing, being able to do 5,000 of something. But I guess if that's, you know, uh, something that might come along again, maybe I can work towards that. Yeah, Gwen, um, so I, I would love to hear if you want to chime in on any of these topics, but also the, the idea of chaos, right? Working with small businesses that do still need to learn basic marketing and answering emails on time and, and things like that. And I think that's where, you know, we hear the word supplier diversity development programs tossed around a lot. And it tends to be only the larger global corporations that have those well-established and I would imagine that what a lot of those programs are about is helping to develop that maturity and, and as well as you know, the operational uh, skills as well. So tell me about your experience of helping entrepreneurs sort of go from chaos to, to more structured and professional uh, you know, delivery and operations. Sure. I think as I'm looking at the chats as well, I'm seeing some questions about um, digital contracts and external consultants, marketing support, et cetera. And so those are some of the things that are very, well, marketing uh, and, and how to brand yourself and communi communicate uh, your, your services and products is one of the topics on our workshops for the Economic Equity Tour as it was one example. Um, just as, as some context, I used to operate a, a small um, business, um, not family owned per se, uh, under a million um, in the West Pacific um, and then in the Southwest, Southwest of the US. And, and I think about my time there for about eight years, more research oriented um, and, and the eight or nine um, small businesses that I surround myself with in terms of my, my core consultants and advisors in terms of sustainability, DEI, et cetera. 
And I think about um, two examples. One is a service provider who is an expert, probably one of the top traumatologists in the world and also in Nevada. And I think about more of a you know, high touch um, or organization that does work um, back of house. We have many MRFs, uh, recycling facilities at each, one of our, at each one of our docks in Las Vegas. And each of the perspectives, it happens to be around how they, um, th their first, second and third impressions with those who influence their contracts. Right. So, so with one of them, it was me advising and, and taking a, a, a closer look at how she was billing us. And in fact, she was billing us 30 percent under her contract and didn't realize that. And so I had really pointed out the need to be on, on top of billing. Um, and I would pre-work with her two or three calls before getting in front of other leaders, you know, because you can think about hospitality, very operational minded, very security, you know, security officers in one of the cases. And uh, this advisor was very cerebral. I mean, I am very, you know, very wonky uh, myself, um, but it wasn't relating to um, the, the security officers or our trainers. So we really worked with her on behind the scenes, uh, shifting the way that she delivered her training, delivered her engagement with, with our, um, our leadership. On the other hand, the, the mini MRF, uh, the recycling facilities, um, you know, grew from five employees to hundreds of employees and now works with many of our competitors, uh, minority supplier as well, um, was not, it was responding, as you said, or uh, responding to emails, um, not responding to emails, uh, not seen on top of invoicing, but it was in a way affecting their ability to produce and to stay on top of, you know, their cash flow. So really working with them on on the whys and hows versus the the marketing aspects, which was the case in early years. I think it really depends on the maturity of the business. Um, in the latter case, they've been working with us for ten years, and the you know the first case with the uh, academic, it was three years. So we've shifted how we've coached them based on the maturity of the business and where they were at in terms of their life cycle as well. I don't know. It's very nuanced, um, and I think much much of this is the more high touch, uh, you know, individual collaboration that we have with these, these supplier partners. Oh, those are excellent examples. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Come on, please. Mm -hmm. add some, uh, just add something about chaos, which is, <laughs> I'm going to say something maybe a little bit um, punchy, but I find that, again, we're the ones buying from small businesses. Absolutely agree invoicing isn't timely. No one's responding to emails. These are things, they're absolutely true. And I do not want to discredit the chaos that also comes from the buyer side. There is a lot of chaos and scarcity mindset that comes, which prohibits collaboration, which detracts from the capacity building that is needed. And so a lot of times when we're working with our buyer partners, they'll be like, Next week, I've got this executive board meeting. We got to do something cool. And it's like, how long did you know about this? <laughs> I'm sure there's been a little bit more lead time than a week. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes there's not. Okay, I'm going to give credit. And 4th of July comes every year, you know, and suddenly two weeks prior, you're like, oh my God, it's 4th of July again. Nope, you always knew that. So the fact that there is, I mean, we're all event planners here. We're in planning in some regard. For you to not be able to forecast what is needed is on you. And so if you are then coming to a small business supplier and saying, okay, within 48 hours, I need 5,000 cupcakes, that is a different capacity than if you were going to then order from XYZ Broadline Distributor who might have inventory on hand. It's not good inventory. I don't know how long it's been sitting par baked somewhere, right? So, so to say that it's all the small business owners fault potentially is wrong, you know? So I just wanted to hold us all accountable here for a moment. Absolutely. I'm going yeah, to really good call. I'm gonna, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I think that is so well put. I think when I, you know, because a lot of times my my clients are people who are making those excuses. I'm always biting my tongue and thinking to myself, really, really? You, 
really? You're just now? <laughs> so I'm glad you said it. Thank you so much for contributing uh, that. That's that's really excellent. So from the supplier side, and I and I think Kim, you know, something you touched on that's really important is these problems are sort of like fluid, right? Is it the buyer's problem, the supplier's problem? I mean, really, if we're trying to all solve a similar problem, which is to uplift a community and to uplift certain populations who have been disadvantaged in terms of growing businesses and supporting their communities and families, then can't we can't we all sort of see our, our part in this and work together on, on the solution? So let's switch a little bit to this from the supplier standpoint. Um, and Jeanette, this time I want to kick this one off to you. And from the cost perspective, you know, statistics show that minority businesses have a more time, a more difficult time getting access to capital and some of the other resources they need to scale. So I'm wondering if you have some real world examples of maybe how that's played out and some of the unique interventions or even traditional interventions, but just haven't traditionally worked for those audiences and, and share those examples. Sure. You know, with Detroit, you know, we're a unique city. I mean, everyone is a unique city in some way, um, but especially around this conversation, Detroit, the city proper is 90% people of color. Okay. 80% black uh, and 90% people of color with, uh, and we're one of the most segregated regions in the entire country. Right. So we, we actually, at our organization, we do tours, not your traditional sightseeing stuff, but really to help people understand um, Detroit's assets and challenges. And one is around, we've done a lot lately, is around the history of racism. So this all goes to that. And I'm, a lot of people here know that, but like the idea that, um, you know, black people in the, in the United States of America couldn't get a home loan until the Fair Housing Act of 60, 1968, like backed by the federal government, our first, and that banks in America, there are only like 22 black owned banks in the United States of America, right? And one of them is here in Detroit, which was opened in 1971 specifically to give funding uh, and work for small business, you know, work and get, because if you have a home, you can take a home equity loan and open a small business, right? It's the capital and it's all connected. Uh, so anyway, I have to always like make sure that we are setting the scene with that. Um, and so in Detroit though, also because of that, we have there has been huge efforts uh, recently um, to invest in, uh, in entrepreneurs um, and take small businesses that might've been, what they uh, also have to understand a lot of um, black entrepreneurs in Detroit didn't even consider themselves entrepreneurs. Like they're like that word, that's a tech word. That's not for me, right? I have a side hustle, I have a small business, but I don't, you know, uh, and so there's been a lot of opportunities. The Build Institute is an amazing organization that um, helps, uh, it does an eight week project planning class, but also works on funding uh, and, and scale as well. So um, one um, example that I like to use is a Good Cakes and Bakes. Uh, and you, everyone, if you want to support a Detroit small business, uh, she's so awesome. And she, during COVID, figured out how to ship her cakes nationally. Um, and uh, But she opened a space in 2013, won a small business competition to uh, that she didn't even mean to win because she wanted to have some more time to open a space in a historically Black neighborhood uh, and had gotten a request um, you know, you know, this is a little bit about capacity and cost, but uh, she would actually have to bake at an offsite from three to six a.m. and then go to her bakery, uh, and her and her cupcakes cost a little bit more because they're, they're but they're organic, and this is it. She pays a living wage and always has. She hires returning citizens. She's a community uh, anchor for her her city for her neighborhood and has now inspired other businesses, um, and. Yeah, it's going to cost more than a hostess Twinkie, right? And I think, and again, I get it from, you know, I used to do, be an event planner at United Way. So like nonprofit stuff, especially was like, oh, we have no budget for a lot of things. But, um, but I think maybe then you just have, you adjust that um, quantity or, you know, the idea of, you don't, everyone doesn't need two or three cupcakes, right? You get one really good quality one uh, or find a way somewhere. And I know that is the part that I, I never totally figured out. So I'm not the best on the budget side, but I would say that to really make the difference that we're talking about, uh, it costs more. We're so used to not paying living wages. We're so used to um, having, you know, the, the, all the capital to be able to, uh, not, to invest and, you know, and not have to worry about a 60 day, you know, invoice kind of thing. So 
Uh, I know it's a little all over the place, but it is important. And there are programs um, that in Detroit are specifically working towards making capital more accessible uh, so that the scale can go up so that the cost can go down. And April now has gotten to that point um, and that she actually went from uh, Bill Clinton asking for 400 vegan brownies and 400 um, um, gooey butter cakes to 24 hours later, making that 800 of each. Uh, and she was able to, you know, turn that around and she might wow. not have been able to a short time ago. That's great. I want to share just a quick quote. And, and I always love pulling in research where I can. And I had another report actually that was, uh, I think, sponsored by Bank of America that was on sort of lending practices to Black, black owned businesses and, and Black families, et cetera. But this particular quote comes from um, I can pop the the link into the the uh, quote into the sorry the chat, but it was a study on small businesses related to the impact of COVID nineteen, and it said small business owners of color were much less likely to have business banking relationship pre pandemic. Thirty one percent of Black, twenty eight percent of AAPI, and twenty six percent of Latino business owners lacked business banking. So just think about that, and think about the fact you know you don't have a business bank account and what that means in terms of being able to do and scale business. And that's not because most of the time, it's not because these people simply chose not to have a, a banking relationship. There's history behind that, right? There's a lot of systemic barriers that have prevented those business owners. I, it's hard to imagine, I think for me, right? I'm a solo but I have a business bank account, right? So I think we have to keep in mind those little things that we take for granted that might be a barrier for uh, the entrepreneur. I don't know if as it relates to the cost issue, uh, Gwen or Kim, you have anything to add or I can move on to a question about contracts. Yeah, I'll just add in that <laughs> we all need stable cash flow, whether you're a small business or a big business, you can't hire, you can't have a marketing budget like there you cannot do so many things around your business growth without stable cash flow and predictable revenues and so that's really what we re aim for with our buyer partners in shifting dollars back into these local suppliers is how can we get to a place where there is some sort of predictability or um, quarterly contractual relationships so that people can start building off of that ongoing revenue. And I'll just share a quick anecdote here where we were at one of our hospital locations this week and I was with my account manager and one of the vendors was delivering and she just said, you know, hey, sir, I'm not going to use the vendor saying, hey, sir, like we're Curate, we're the ones who order from you, like just good to see you, thanks for dropping off, being a great local supplier. And he was like, oh my gosh, like your curate, we order about 200 units from them week over week and it's about $8 a unit. So $1,600 a week. Um, and so he was like, oh my gosh, your curate, like on my bag here, it says like curate Kim Bryden. I'm just like always so interested to know like, who is this Kim Bryden? And my account manager is like, well, that's her. And I was like, hey, and he goes, oh, a mythical being. And I was like, <laughs> What a hilarious thing. Uh, but to the point I'm trying to make is like, that is huge for a small business, right? Sometimes when we're thinking about buy local, we're thinking about construction, IT, these really large contracts. And uh, what I'm trying to say is a $2,000 purchase order means so much. If it's consistent and week over week or month over month, it means the world to so many entrepreneurs. So think about your budgets, right? And, and how that might be a consistent cash flow opportunity. And, and Gwen, maybe I, I'd love to hear anything you want to chime in here. I specifically want to hear your thoughts on best practices that small businesses might employ when they're trying to get contracts with big with big companies. But, but based on something Kim just said, and I was actually thinking this earlier, so I'm glad I came back around, as it relates to goal setting and reporting, it seems like we probably have to have a mind shift, especially in larger corporations, right? So if we're talking about a percent of spend, 5%, you know, when I look at supplier diversity reports, sometimes I'm like, that's 8% of your spend, you're patting yourself on the back. But then I have to think about 
the context of what Kim just said, that that's, that small number means more to that small business than maybe that same amount would mean to a global corporation. So I'm just curious how you've adjusted the mindset and the perspective, the lens through which you look at the goal setting and the metrics. Sure. I would say we, as with many companies, have a long way. <laughs> have a long way to go and it's a refresh, right? Every every couple of years. We went through, we're, we're on our third CEO, or actually fourth CEO in six years. Um, so just with every new leadership, right now it's about a post-merger. We were, Citrus was bought out, um, resetting uh, baselines and, and going after internally. What should our goal setting be? How should we grow the pool of suppliers? Um, and, I, and I think to Kim's earlier point, empathy among amongst buyers, particularly large corporate companies, is huge in terms of needing to educate and simplify and get them to understand, wow, I, like sometimes my, I shouldn't say my colleagues, but just, when I see some things about how long people take to respond or sitting on an invoice, so we have a 15-day turnaround for certified supply, minority suppliers in terms of invoice payments, but you know, what is the accountability of that manager who might be sitting around on it for a bit, right? I mean, we have to have internal, better internal accountability, better internal empathy when it comes to not just, you know, introducing, say, tomorrow, Native American, uh, the National Center of Native American Owned Businesses is going to present in front of our, our leadership and our CEO, but what is the next phase around empathy on buying decisions and standards internally on how to influence this? So I think I think there's a huge opportunity there in terms of shifting the mindset, but also simplifying it, right? Because we have got five supplier diversity colleagues. I'm on the strategy side. When I see it, it, it's not up to the five to navigate the 6,000 contracts that might come up in a normal year. It's about you know educating the influence of hundreds, if not thousands, of influencers within the company to make better decisions, have standards to meet, you know, whether it be one third of supplier, one third of RFPs um, going to a certified minority supplier, right? That was an internal goal. How do we refresh that and keep people accountable, particularly if they're at the SVP level and can and should look at a year over year increase? So I think simplified standards and empathy. Em empathy is probably the most difficult to teach and retain. Yes, absolutely. And, and I agree. I think there's a, a pretty big disconnect between um, centralized decisions, which of course a lot of sustainability and diversity, equity, inclusion decisions tend to be centralized at a headquarters versus what's happening on the ground. I run a green team course in which mostly the, the people who go through that course are more line level. Uh, it's been taken by a lot of college students, a lot of them in the hospitality industry. And what I hear over and over and over and over again, one of their first assignments is research what your company is doing with regard to all of these topics. We're talking about corporate responsibility, social impact, CSR, whatever, sustainability, whatever. And I hear over and over and over again from those who work in chains, I had no idea our company was doing this. I had no idea. So they're not seeing a manifestation of these things. And of course, part of my passion is to teach them that they can, they don't have to sit around and wait for someone you know, to come and, and do it, they can actually take the reins and make that happen within their span of control right where they are. So I think there's a lot of, I think empathy is true, but I think also empowering. Because what I find is that a lot of people that are at lower levels in an organization who want to, who may be in a position to drive a small choice, like let's buy these cupcakes instead of those, they feel tight, they feel really sort of, um, handcuffed to contracts and things and they don't really know what the what they're afraid of getting their hands slapped they don't want to take a risk and break a contract which maybe they actually can but they're not going to be the ones to stick their neck out and they see these topics as being the the, the purview of, of those up at corporate and they don't really understand their own role in being able to oops, I'm sorry Echo started talking to me just then. I'm going to unplug her. Um, they don't know their own role in being able to implement these policies. So I, I think that you're touching on some really important things there. I'd like to ask each of you um, if you can, you've kind of, I think, all touched on this a little bit. In fact, I think uh, Kim especially, but I think probably all of you bring to bear a, a yourself, you are an answer to this question. But what sort of resources organizations, partners, government, whatever the case may be, what sort of resources 
do you think exist to help bridge this gap? So um, not only from the supplier standpoint, but also resources that a buyer might look for in a community like those chambers of commerce, et cetera, to help them sort of like help us connect the dots and bridge the gap. So Jeanette, let's start with you. What are some examples um, and, and maybe even talk a little bit about, you know, your own role in that as well? Yeah, the, uh, there are a lot of resources, um, but but they, even the chambers by themselves, they're very large too, right? So do all of the really the small businesses and how connected do they feel? You know, you still have to get to a certain level or, um, you know, powers that be to, to be known by, you know, those chambers, especially in big cities. And that's why we, you know, we exist at Detroit Experience Factory. And I can see, you know, the work that Kim does as well. It's really finding someone who is on the ground, who lives, you know, for us in the city. Like I started this because I grew up in Detroit. I've never not lived here. I'm walking around. I was learning stuff that I never realized my whole life living here and how I could share that with other people. And to the point about marketing that was brought up earlier, yeah, small businesses do not have billboard budgets and, you know, big, you know, or even just the time to be making, to look up lists of who we should call about big businesses to, to connect with, right? So, I mean, social media has made that a little easier uh, and, you know, in some cases, um, but I think finding the organization, the on the ground expert, and also challenging the CVBs in, you know, for those that are going to different places, um, is our CVB didn't know a lot either, right? They were part of the Metro Convention and Visitors Bureau. So they didn't know the city and the small businesses in the city. Um, we worked with them. For example, there's this amazing 1935 jazz club that was completely restored. It's called Cliff Bells. And the Visitors Bureau couldn't bring people there for dinner, clients there for dinner or potential conferences because they weren't a member, right? So we actually, they hired us to work with these small businesses to say, hey, it's actually worth it. It's not always that they can't afford the 150 bucks, it's that they don't feel like what's the Visitors Bureau is gonna do for me and is it worth it? And even knowing about this event world, like people who are not in the event world, uh, I mean, and I'm still like flabbergasted sometimes, like the, you know, the, the amount of societies out there, right? We hosted ASAE in Detroit in 2015, you know, and worked to get as many people locally and small businesses engaged in that event. Uh, but talking to people, they were like, this is what they'd never certainly heard of ASAE. The idea that there's a uh, piano tuners society of America, you know, which actually I did a tour for to, you know, help connect them to, to small businesses. Um, that was really interesting. And I guess I would say also, when you live in a place, there's an assumption that you know what's in that place. And I guarantee you, you don't, especially the small businesses that are off your beaten path, right? We're all creatures of habit. You go to the same place, stay in the same neighborhood. And because of the history of segregation in our, in our country, that frequently is you're not visiting businesses of color or businesses that are different than you. And so you have to actively search out opportunities to explore, to connect with um, organizations that are telling that story, whether it's a chamber of commerce, uh, block clubs, CDCs, community development or organizations. And I would also add our entrepreneurial organizations, right? So Build Institute locally, uh, one of the great assets they provide, kind of similar to Curate, I think, is that if you want to have a sell local cool things at your place, you know, it, at your conference or your event, uh, and you don't want to contact a hundred different people, they have all their entrepreneurs that they can bring and show up. One, you know, one contact that brings all these entrepreneurs to you selling really cool stuff, uh, and that is really great for the event. I just want to share a quick story from Detroit that I think just goes along with what you said about sometimes you don't even know. I, I do this a lot. I do the talk on this bi local topic. And a lot of times I will go into, you know, the client and I'm doing a presentation. And I'll be like, how about this for like a bi local program? And I can't tell you how often I see these looks like, oh, we never knew about that. Like, how did you find that? Uh, Google, you know? And so one of the ones I did is I was training on food waste at the D Detroit in the convention center. And I went there, you know, because I just do what I do. I went there a couple of days early and spent a weekend in the Airbnb and just kind of walked, went and explored little places around the city. 
And I was, I had in my mind, I really wanted to do something with a social enterprise in Detroit. I try to do something a little bit different in each of these, these trainings in each of these locations. And I just, I didn't know what that looked like, but it was just, you know, it was like I had this, this, this desire to do this. And I honestly feel this might be a little too metaphysical for some people, but I feel like if you put that energy out, the city will tell you what it has. And I was in a coffee shop. It was like a 12 below zero blustery, snowy day. I was in a coffee shop over a barber shop. It was like, you go in the barber shop, you go up to the coffee shop and I'm at the checkout ordering my bourbon vanilla latte or whatever it was. And there's a pamphlet for a local high school that teaches chil- uh, young adults with intellectual disabilities. So Down syndrome and, and um, it, the spectrum of, you know, sort of neurodiversity and they train them on culinary skills. And so at the Sustainable Brands show in 20, what was that, 2019, I think it was, we had, you know, I called and asked the director like, you know, how do we get involved? How do, you know, can your students maybe work in the kitchen at one of the shows? And he said he, that he had some students that he really wanted to have opportunities to learn more socialization. So we had some students that actually worked out on the line serving food. And it was just this great experience that we would have, it would never have happened. It, you know, it just was like a random beautiful thing. So I think sometimes we have to leave room for a little bit of poetic <laughs> sort of um, happenstance. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad uh, you mentioned what you did because I think that that's, uh, that's a beautiful story to share. Uh, and I will say just really yeah. quick, and I know we're gonna other people, uh, but even choosing Detroit as a location for your conference and event, that in and of itself, you know, and like we worked with sustainable brands, right? So we're fre- frequently some, the closer for these tours. Like every city has, you know, you start comparing convention centers and again, all this, all that data and stuff, but what's the feeling of a place and what's the impact you can have by coming there? And so, ha- you know, I was so excited when sustainable brands like chose to come from San Diego to Detroit. People are like, you're doing what now? Um, but it, it had a huge impact and, uh, and also once people get here, they love it, right? And they feel that connection and that um, that Detroit isn't like every other place. And that's that kind of metaphor for all the small businesses. It's worth it to go that extra mile. Yeah. All right, Gwen, Gwen and Kim, anything you'd like to add on sort of the resources and organizations that you might connect with or that be either the buyer or the supplier could connect with to connect these dots? Kim, do you want to go? Okay, so um, just again, briefly on what we do at Curate, we become actually the master supplier of local goods at your account. So whether you work with a center plate or an Aramark or anything in between, we work with them as one of their vendors akin to them buying from Cisco, US Foods, Pepsi, et cetera. We're another one of those types of um, uh, vendors in their system. And so the reason why this solution has presented itself as we've discussed here on this panel is that our our big business systems are set up to buy from other big businesses. And you want one person to place an order with and one person to pay the the bill um, while having access to that wide diverse of suppliers in your backyard. So that is fundamentally what we do. We are based in the mid-Atlantic. Our Headquarters is in DC and as well as the heartland, we have a hub in Northwest Arkansas. I know totally what you were expecting. So uh, if you are in the mid-Atlantic or the heartland, definitely reach out, would love to work with you. Uh, And to what you shared Aurora about that like serendipitous moment there, I would just encourage people to think about, are you planning an event for Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, where might you look for Latinx entrepreneurs to put their products at the point of sale? Like what is the user experience that you're trying to create and then seek out these different channels for exploration and creativity based on that desired user experience. So maybe not just one one place to direct yourself to, but, but what is the overall takeaway you want someone to walk away with Once upon a time, I thought I was going to be a museum curator. This is how like my brain works. Like what's the high level message down to like the font on the wall. Um, Hence the name of Curate. 
full circle here. Curated oh, the connection it. between big and small. But yeah, I, I just think that being intentional about the experience you're wanting to, to design is the best way to go about then attracting the right suppliers for it. Excellent. Gwen, how about you? Sure. So each, I know that some of you mentioned, um, you know, navigating the, the local chambers, but uh, if you're not hearing, if, if it's been, if, if they are challenged, um, I, I would love to, to understand because we, we do pay for membership with, with nine of them, um, the nationals and each of them have locals. And if it's not working for, or for, for small businesses or small local businesses, I'd, I'd be very curious to know how and why, because as partners, uh, we need to, to fix that as well. Um, I think the other piece is around resources. Um, we do have a supplier um, mentorship program as well. It is not to scale it, in it as it should be. That is one thing. We work with a uh, supplier diversity group works with a few um, organizations each uh, year, and each of them will work with a few organizations each year. And uh, we'll look at uh, two-year relationships around supplier uh, and capacity building as well, kind of on a one-on-one -on -one more curated route. Um, there's also each each of the nine often offer the you know, U.S. Hispanic Chamber, LGBTQ Chamber, et cetera, matchmaking programs, which we will participate in and identify, and depending on the contracts that are for up, up for renewal or open, um, at requesting a matchmaking uh, conversations as well. Um, and I think that the last one being um, free and it is year round is the, the foundation, Teachers Foundation Economic Equity Tour, uh, which we are taking um, signups for. If you're interested, I can you know, happily send this group uh, information as we are we um, reintroducing it in the next month uh, for another round of 12 months as well. Excellent. Thank you, Gwen. I really appreciate that your answer to that was, hey, if something's not working, let me know, because as a larger member, corporate member of these kinds of organizations, you do have more power and more ability to uh, raise awareness of these issues. And so I really, uh, really respect that you sort of opened up that opportunity for others to reach out and say, well, here's the barriers that we're facing and, and here's what we're observing. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you to give us just maybe a quick, you know, one minute final closing thought. We've covered a lot of ground today, even though we are trying to scope this down a little bit. Um, I'd like your final thought on if, as we move forward, we're trying to turn this into, or we are going to turn this into this cohort series. We're going to have a series of meetings and the idea is to roll up our sleeves and just kind of unpack these things further and come up with maybe a checklist or a toolkit or something practical that the industry could, could use. I would love in sort of your closing thoughts to hear what you think would be the top low hanging fruit opportunity that a small group of volunteers could reasonably work on over the next few months to, to create something that industry could use. Um, Gwen, why don't we start with you since you're probably more familiar with, with the what we mean by the industry and how we might use that. And then we'll go to Kim and then close with Jeanette. Yeah, I think if it's I think if it's something that simplifies and standardizes an expected practice of buyers, particularly large corporate buyers, that that could be, you know, that would be something that I would get behind, and I I would like to advocate it with it with our group of nine minority supplier partners, as well as other. We we do have a year round uh, diversity summit, a seizures curated diversity summit with. Uh, 50 large corporate partners, vendors, um, as well as the 20 national diversity partners. And these are this supplier diversity piece and standardization um, was one of the aspects that the group came up with in 2019. We're going to revisit that as well. So there's different avenues I think we can do, but it's such a, it's such a complex space that I think standardizing and advocating for that group of principles, but a very actionable group versus a qualitative activity would be really helpful. Excellent. Um, and, and you might be getting an email or call from me to further <laughs> explore what that could look like and how as a group we might be able to develop something you would find useful in, in that context. Sure. Kim, what about you? I would love if the group could think through values-based procurement instead of lowest bidder procurement and what we might be emphasizing as key metrics in values-based procurement instead of lowest bidder. The cheapest food is certainly not the healthiest food, nor is it the most sustainable, nor is it putting money back into our economies. So how might we add in these other metrics of success so that all of the stakeholders in our organizations realize that 
the cost savings is not actually worth it in the long run. I wish we had just thought about that more generally in American capitalism, but that's for another day. <laughs> here, here, I, I, I love it. Uh, Jeanette. I think, you know, start somewhere, not everywhere is the kind of motto of our small business community here. So even if it's literally a checklist that combines some of these things that we talked about, you know, have you talked to a local expert? Have you walked the streets in your community, you know, or in a neighboring community that, you know, has a diverse population um, or found that black club expert or, or the Kim or the me in any, you know, in whatever city. And with my organization, City Institute, that's what we're actually working with other cities to do is help them tell the story, help them be that on the ground resource uh, and storyteller of the of the place, not on a tourist level, but on a on a real content level. Um, so I think that would be a really a simple way to start. And and I always end, you know, a lot of different tours and conversations with my motto about Detroit, but I think it can apply here. And so my motto for Detroit is that Detroit is big enough to matter in the world and small enough for you to matter in it. And I think that can be tweak to say that each of you and each of the events that you have and corporations that you work with uh, are big enough to matter in the world. And you are absolutely, absolutely small enough to matter in your individual community, in the event sector. Uh, you can make a difference. It seems really daunting. But as Kim mentioned earlier, even if it is just a small percentage, that can be a huge part of a small business and lead to a much uh, more robust and diverse supplier chain in the future. I love it. Thank you. What wonderful statements from each of you. And we're really going to take that to heart as we move forward. Um, thank you all for uh, joining. We're going to switch now to have Paul and David join and just kind of you know, as the, the leaders of this, like, how do we move forward and initiative and conversation, we're just going to talk a little bit about, you know, maybe what some of the things that stood out to them. So I'm going to just queue up their, uh, the slide that has their name so you know who I'm talking about. I say the imperative is ours because now we've got to work on some solutions to these problems. Hmm. So I'd like to invite uh, David and Paul as You've been part of these conversations uh, from early on. You are, uh, you know, obviously people that are actually doing this kind of work in the world. And so I'm just wondering what really struck you from our conversation today as both maybe something new you learned and as the opportunity that we have moving forward in the cohort to actually develop real practical solutions. Uh, Paul, let's start with you. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists. That was such incredible content, and we could probably spend hours unpacking everything that was said today, which <clears throat> should leave you a lot of topics for your cohort to, <laughs> to work on. Um, there was a lot, you know, that, that I took away from it. I mean, I took a lot of notes, but, you know, I think, I think what we're hearing is, is that some of the issues around supply chain diversity are some of the same issues that we face in sustainability in general when it comes to some of the environmental things. You know, we don't measure, we don't really share our data, we're not transparent about what we're doing. Um, and that are those are all things that we can potentially work on. Um, I loved some of the examples. Um, you know, just in general, you know, how do we get past some of these barriers, I think is a great, a great <clears throat> way to think about it. Um, you know, there, I think there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of things that we can think about and work on in the, um, in the, uh, in the cohorts. But one of the big questions that I have that I think that we should look at is, <clears throat> Some of this is like, how are, we, how are we actually training event teams and event people around this? Are we really putting money into this when, we, when, when corporations and organizations talk about DEI? Are they really investing in it with their event teams so that the event teams understand and know to walk the neighborhoods, to look for local suppliers, to look for minority suppliers? to think about how they can create networks for those local suppliers to work together. You know, some of the examples that Jeanette brought up, I think were great ones in terms of, and, and Kim as well, in terms of, you know, how do you create value spaces for those, <clears throat> for those suppliers? And how do you help them work together? How do you help them get funding? You know, 
corporations in particular, you know, this idea of funds is, is an interesting one in terms of, you know, could, could corporations even band together to create funds for local and small suppliers and help train them and help vet them and help get them, you know, to understand how to scale up. So those are some of the things that I sort of took away and I think are interesting things that we could potentially work on in the cohorts. And I, and I also love the idea that Jeanette brought up at the end of, you know, just sort of a basic toolkit for, you know, for, um, for buyers to think about when they're looking for small suppliers. So those were just a few of mine. I'll let David jump in and then we can go from there. Thanks, Paul. Um, oh, uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, I echo your uh, support and enthusiasm for a great panel today. I think one of the biggest things that uh, stood out to me was the notion around cheapest is not the best for many of our goals around products and services, but also around environmental and social goods. And and um, I think Kim, your point that like uh, let's let's bifurcate the conversation on capitalism. I I actually say like no, let's bring it. I, I think we've all been trained to do that, right? We've been trained to um, compartmentalize these topics so they're tackable. And at some point we have to, right? At some point we have to kind of put them in segments that we can tackle. But at the same time. I think what we've certainly seen around the last 12 to 18 months around a, a variety of issues that we've all faced in the news is that um, by looking more holistically, there's greater opportunity to actually address these in a more meaningful way that, that when we are only addressing the symptoms of the issues, there's only so much change we can make. Um, I'm not asking to be too radical here. We are at the intersection of business and doing good, um, but we can do good for our business and for society environmental issues at the same time. And I think we need to lean into um, to what you said, Kim, um, uh, versus lean away from it. Um, uh, looking at my notes, you know, I think the effort is worth it. When Sustainable Brands was in Detroit, we, you know, we, and I was leading the charge for the conference, we specifically tried to bring in food from, um, you know, the farmer's market. Farmer's market uh, and food is one of the easiest things to tackle, but one of the like largest systems within our kind of ecosystem, right? Working with convention caterers or caterers of any nature, they're to make their profit margin, right? They need to work at scale. Um, but what we tried to do was something small as a pilot program. So we worked with um, MUFI, which is Michigan Organic Farmers Association, or what is it, Jeanette? Help me here. Um, Michigan Urban Farming Institute. That's what it is. China. I got it. Okay, try to <laughs> try to get the memory working. But we we worked with them. But we had to work with them like. Um, ahead of the season, so it took a lot of forced thought to think about how to incorporate a local food component and a local nonprofit into our menu planning and food sourcing. And the chef actually was so excited to do it. He's like, oh, I, I just get stuck working with Cisco. Uh, this is fantastic. I love this. So we um, brought the local uh, farming nonprofit to the convention center catering team and they brought them into their kitchen to pickle. Um, I forget what, I think it was radishes. They had an overabundance of radishes. They knew the crop was going to yield um, extra radishes, and we brought them into the kitchen. We weren't even there for any of this, but we did the matchmaking, brought them into the kitchen, they pickled these radishes, and then a year later, we served them um, at one of our marquee kind of invite-only lunches during the conference. And I could say there's a small nod to local here, but it's an example of a pilot program that took a lot of effort, but I feel was worth it and was disruptive to kind of the normal flow. It got the chef thinking differently, it got the convention center thinking differently, and I think it's small steps like like that 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 help. Um, and at the end, you know, disrupt. Um, so I think in general, the theme of kind of disruption and getting out of the normal and familiar, um, explore in person, explore over the internet, communicate and outreach, right? So, and think ahead. I mean, many of us are sourcing as sometimes three to five years out. And as you do that, start to plant flags and start to plant beacons that call for inclusivity, uh, minority inclusion, um, differentiation and suppliers. And then ask the suppliers of your suppliers to do the same. Um, so when even when it comes to AV, I think one of the biggest things I, I tend to start asking AV companies is where are you, if you're doing sub rentals, where are they coming from? Can you rent from local music shops or other places that provide the, um, the back line and other gear that supplement um, what they have? What will be the transportation footprint? So I think the intersectionality of the themes of environmental and social um, provide us a lot of opportunity to do good while doing well. Um, and I do think the effort's worth it. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to storytell. I think we're also seeing in this day and age, there's a lot of 
need to differentiate yourself and make yourself, your brand, your event, your conference uh, unique. And the best way to do that is to storytell around all the um, different contributions from suppliers and um, within your supply chain. So let me pause there and, and go to more prompts. Yeah, we're, we're almost out of time. Jeanette, did you have something you wanted to add in real quick here? Uh, I just wanted to, you know, like David, when he came to Detroit, uh, if you could talk about just in one minute about what you thought it was going to be like and what it was going to be like. And I think that's the thing you go into, uh, whether it's coming to Detroit or just going into a supply, a minority supplier, and you think it's going to be daunting and it's a little harder, but at the end, I mean, you, your mind was changed, right? I guess is what I'm saying. The before and after what David thought when he got on a plane and then what he thought at um, it, it's exactly true. I think being open-minded, I think the biggest thing going into Detroit and then in learning from Detroit was a reinforcement about getting out of the norm, making new relationships, making new friends, making new suppliers, um, and being open-minded with enthusiasm and zeal. And, you know, I think it fed my mind. I think, I know it fed our company's mind and soul, and I think it showed up for our attendees and our sponsors. Um, so I think that's the, the biggest thing is, is kind of letting go of expectations and, and coming into with a, a learning mindset, an exploration mindset. I mean, it really, it, it really speaks to, you know, kind of the whole conversation too about destinations in general. You know, we're focused a little bit on Detroit today, but, you know, we often as an industry choose the easy destinations to go to, Las Vegas or Orlando or whatever. And if we really want to, you know, diversify our, our industry, why are we not going to Detroit, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Cleveland, some of these cities that are, you know, have a lot of diversity and we, ha we have that opportunity to kind of spread the wealth, if you will, and be more equitable as an industry. And we're just not taking advantage of it. So Paul, I, I hope that that's the seed planted for the topic we can address in 2022. I love that topic. I, I think it starts to broaden our scope a little much, too much for what we were going to tackle in the next sure. few months. But that I think should be the next on our list. Um, we need to wrap up. Let me just share my screen real quick. So I want everyone, please, 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 here's what's next. It's not just about today. Today was awesome. I loved this conversation, but please consider showing up for the series of conversations we're gonna have. You don't need to be an expert. You don't even need to have done these things before. If you've faced any of the challenges we talked about today, we need your voice as part of this. So consider joining the cohort where we're gonna work on the checklist and, and work on solving problems. If you can't show up for the conversations, please stay tuned to SFSC or other channels where we may give you opportunity to input, maybe through surveys, maybe we'll do like a virtual collaboration space, LinkedIn posts, et cetera. Please consider being part of the conversation and invite others who, after you heard this today, maybe it resonates and you think, I think so-and-so would really have something to say here or really had value to add, please invite others. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna turn it over to Christoph. And I just thank you again to uh, SFSC for inviting me to lead this very important conversation. Well, thank you, Aurora. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're very excited to, um, to listening to all of this is absolutely incredible. So I have three minutes. I'm going to thank our sponsors uh, very quick again. Um, uh, MedAvent, uh, Solu Sustainable Adoration, and Orange Photography. Uh, today, it was absolutely an incredible um, conversation. I mean, buying local, small and diverse is more important than ever. And thank you for participating today. And um, I would love for you to join the rest of the series and participating is incredibly important. So here's a QR code right there. Take a picture and register today for the rest of the series. Um, and we all have this ability to change. So let's do it now. So thank you for today. Thank you for the board. Thank you for the educational committee. Thank you for speakers. Thank you for the program designers. Uh, we so look forward to the next uh, series. We'll be on September 14 for Carbon. And please follow our social media and support our effort. And again, thank you. That was so inspiring. Um, I am inspired today. And um, so thank you again and see you very soon and have a wonderful day everyone thank you again thank you very much have a good day
Thank you. Thank you.